Lasso, Samala, Tarinche, Jimmy, Tatting, Gabri, Calico, Sanjin, 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 and then, yeah, the profound dharma of all the Buddhas and, and Bodhisattvas is, uh, of course, very precious. Oh, did it? do and also, um, I have a feeling that uh, among the audience there are also uh, high realized beings like Bodhisattvas and Buddhas. So I feel very uncomfortable sitting here. <laughs> And then, um, on top of that, there are also people who have uh, a deep knowledge of the Dharma, who are present. So also, I feel uncomfortable uh, teaching here in front of them. So then I imagine uh, for myself, or I have a discriminating factor, that all those uh, holy beings being here present, they're actually sitting higher than myself and uh, making offerings to them. <laughs> but if I want to escape, I don't know where to escape to. So then, from the point of view of introducing uh, myself, as there might be people who already know me, but maybe some people do not. So yeah, I'm a, a, a lady from uh, Tibet, and uh, from a worldly perspective, uh, born in Tibet. Oh, lasso. Oh, that jocha, Chanju is sem semba zambu jocha in zani. Ani shinda ne keva zambu. Ta chimbo tinde jocha ani ti to la garang mashe na ani je semba nanda ge. So then the topic of uh, today is, uh, is bodhicitta and that by itself is a very uh, precious topic as well as to hear about it and contemplate it is very fortunate. Mm. So even if you are a non-believer or a believer, uh, from both perspectives, it's important to uh, generate a, a good mind and, and, and good intention. So that's true for all beings, and then a good intention means to work for the welfare of all sentient beings. So in a similar way, we have to practice like altruism and love and kindness, and uh, we should make that as a part of our life, and uh, with that part of our life, we should move forward. <laughs> Similar, 
we all have this kind of potential or this kind of wish of, of an aspiration towards bodhicitta or love and kindness and compassion. So we all share that same aspiration. So then we have this potential in our mind and, and this uh, kind of aspects of these positive states of mind that are with us present already or kind of almost naturally present. But then we have the afflictions like anger and attachment that will, uh, yeah, has the potential to take over. So then just having the mere wish for love and kindness and compassion in bodhicitta uh, or the prayer by itself, that is not enough, of course. So then we should uh, yeah, take this as an aspiration and walk in, in that direction and then make sure we get the right conditions or corporate conditions, so to say, to develop these potentials of the mind. So from a worldly perspective, then also we see that we have uh, the various kind of uh, corporate conditions in life to, to enhance those positive qualities of the mind. So then if you look from a first of all from a worldly perspective, then uh, most people in the world they follow the sensory perceptions, so to say, or the doors of the senses. And uh, if it's very, it's basically a coarse aspect of the achievement of happiness through uh, the, the sensory perceptions. And not only is very coarse, but also it's not very stable. It will not be stable. The happiness we gain from uh, sensory perception is not very stable. And the objects of the senses don't really bring a kind of stable form of happiness, but also in the nature of, in, of change. It's always changing. So um, we also need to combine our positive intentions with wisdom and that is very important for us as humans. And then when we try to generate positive intentions of the mind, it's important to also use wisdom in analyzing when is attachment, for example, involved 
when I generate like of guidance and compression. So we need a kind of a basis, like the ground or the foundation of a house, so to say, for ourselves to, to move to uh, more stable forms of happiness to be achieved. And in a similar way, we should look outside and look at all uh, sentient beings, because all sentient beings are exactly the same as us, wanting happiness and not wanting suffering. So then we take ourselves as a basis, and then from that, we go out to sentient beings. <laughs> So then our basis, or our house, so to say, then we know it's in the nature of impermanence. So one day it will be destroyed, one day we die. So then, um, as we said before, it's very important to join our good intentions like love and kindness with, um, with wisdom, otherwise it so remains quite short-sighted. Yeah? So we have to look at the world and we have to look sentient beings and then have a wish to protect those sentient beings and like to help those sentient beings because all those beings are actually like our mothers and our fathers. And uh, we should try to generate a close connection with them uh, by contemplating those aspects. And then, of course, guard our mind that we don't get attached, that attachment is not involved. So with that aspect, you need uh, also uh, the aspect of wisdom to be with those good intentions. And then we try to, whatever acts we do with our body, speech, and mind uh, for the benefit of, of beings, so to say, and then try to think how we could help self and others by the power of study or praising others or helping others in various ways. And if you think in those lines, then using wisdom, then the mind becomes more subtle and your, your form of, of good attitudes becomes more profound. Jin Sim 
So then, as we know, we are self. We strive for happiness and don't like suffering. Uh, so we should see that uh, all others are in exactly the same, uh, con in exactly the same conditions. And uh, by seeing that and also looking at the dependence that when we are harmed, then uh, we don't like that. So we also try to understand that aspect of it as well. And that's why we uh, generate compassion and love and kindness for others by understanding that relationship. If something happens to us, how we will react. Uh, then when we get close to, to, um, to those beings, then also or we generate this kind hardness to, to sentient beings, then it's also important to prevent uh, those uh, who are close to take, uh, that we generate attachment towards them and those at distance that we uh, generate aversions towards them. So we should use the various reasons based on, on, on wisdom that we have kind of an equanimity towards all uh, sentient beings and that prevents, or, and, and we should prevent, aspects of jealousy and competition in our life uh, by understanding the points we just talked about, in the particular that all sentient beings want happiness and not want suffering exactly the same wish as we have. And take that into account, then we should walk for the benefit of others. So we all have kind of respect, of course, for, for the Buddhas and also for sentient beings. Chill Ningi also so then if we look a bit more deeper into these aspects of um, uh, where it's related with our perceptions, yeah, so that the Buddhas and sentient beings uh, uh, by the kindness of them, and that's why we respect them. And then we can see that uh, sentient beings are disturbed. Sentient beings have many wrong views. And by the power of, of the wrong view, in the particular, the wrong view of apprehension of a self, uh, that's what we call uh, ignorance, right? That people misunderstand reality. Uh, 
And that is then related with uh, our external and internal worlds that we perceive uh, the reality in an inc incorrect way, what we call ignorance, uh, in an incorrect and true way, or grasping at a self. And that triggers uh, afflictions like anger and attachment. So that's kind of an aspect we have to look on, uh, what, what actually is causing all these problems of these afflictions. And then we see that it's all rooted in a sense of uh, aspect of ignorance. Although we all want happiness and don't want suffering, as long as there is ignorance, we cannot accomplish those two aims. So it's important to understand reality. So what is actually the ultimate reality? What is conventional reality? How do things appear? And what is actually its actual nature? And that's also true for our own mind. We should understand uh, the true nature of our mind as well. Because not knowing aspects, and, uh, in particular with regards to the reality, uh, of, of the outer and internal worlds, then we have this kind of not knowing of ignorance. And by knowing the reality, we generate a kind of wisdom that understands the inner and our, our world as it is. So we need to make a distinction between what actually is reality and the things that appear to us, and which aspects that are mistaken, and which aspects are kind of illusory like, or which aspects have this perfect, per perception of a mistaken view. And then we see, as long as we have uh, ignorance, then we cannot really comprehend and understand reality as it is. So it's for us important to, to see the difference between uh, the mistaken views or the distorted, kind of, uh, distorted uh, perceptions and, and the wisdom understanding the actual reality as it is. Mm. <laughs> Sindhi, <laughs> Sinji so then, so then, yeah, I went a little bit into emptiness, uh, but yeah, it's important. And, and uh, we talked about love and kindness and compassion. And that is then also related with two aspects of, of our view, or the view we have towards uh, the world, so to say, and our behavior. Yeah, and then most people, although they strive for happiness and don't want suffering, often people engage in incorrect forms of views and incorrect forms of behavior. So although they want happiness and don't want suffering, they actually create the causes for suffering and abandon uh, the causes for happiness. And then in a similar way, we see uh, people, they see suffering as happiness and they see impermanent aspects of reality as permanent and they see selflessness uh, as, as having a uh, self. So there are kind of incorrect views of, of reality uh, many sentient beings uh, have. Soyon Deni <laughs> Tendis 
So then, um, every day, so to say, we have um, to think about these aspects of, of the world and, and sentient beings, and then prevent ourselves from making uh, strong distinctions. Uh, for example, we usually do that with our own family, and we like to protect our own family for anybody else that likes to harm or says no says incorrect things about our family. And we do also do that with countries. We really um, have kind of a lot of uh, feeling for our own country, but maybe not of other countries. So then what happens is that we make a distinction between friends and enemies. And those distinctions of friends and enemies come about by the afflictions of attachments to those who are close, who you consider as friends, and aversion or anger or hatred to those you uh, consider as distance or you don't like. Uh, that's true for places, that's true for countries, that we make distinctions. And actually, if you really think about it, it's like a joke, because uh, that's an incorrect understanding of reality. We need a wisdom that understands these aspects. Uh, if we don't have that wisdom, then we have boundaries, and, and then we have wars, and then we have aversion to those we dislike, and um, we have attachments to our own people of our own country. So we see by the power of aversion and attachment in this way, there are wars going on, and the wars, they uh, produce all kind of very dangerous weapons of, of things going all the way up to mass destruction. So that's kind of an aspect that is all rooted in these afflictions. So we can clearly see that these afflictions are the cause for suffering. And then by the actions of these uh, particular actions based or rooted in these afflictions, we, of course, create various types of karma, and that's, uh, if you look at these kind of uh, aspects of what's happening in the world, then it's very dangerous. And this aspect of karma and afflictions, so that those two aspects are then rooted in an aspect of ignorance. And not only ignorance, but also an aspect of uh, the self cherishing attitude. So we have two aspects there of, of, of grasping at, an, at, an, at a self, and uh, as well as the self cherishing attitude. So because of those afflictions related with those two attitudes, then there are, we make distinctions between us and them. And that happens not only in our family, 
or those who are close to us, that also happens in the whole world with, um, between the different countries. And that's why people actually, for small purposes of, of getting more property or, or getting more land, people engage in war. Uh, so that's kind of an aspect to see that all the problems in the world and the problems in our lives are created by these afflictions, uh, in particular ignorance, aversion and attachment. Then uh, we have to look about sentient beings, as we said before, we should have respect for sentient beings and the Buddhas because um, we all can achieve Buddhahood and all sentient beings can achieve Buddhahood. So for that purpose we should also respect sentient beings and should know that it's possible to achieve Buddhahood because our ultimate nature of the mind, uh, the ultimate nature of the mind of sentient beings and those of Buddhas, uh, there's no real distinction. It's just the temporary uh, or advantageous afflictions that makes a difference. So then we, and all sentient beings, not only us, but all sentient beings can achieve Buddhahood by the correct mind trainings and by uh, realizing the ultimate nature of the mind, uh, so to say. And if you understand these aspects, then automatically you will generate respect for all sentient beings because all sentient beings have that same potential to develop and become a Buddha themselves. And then your interest will move into the paths. And that's kind of what we, why we need this kind of wisdom of understanding what's actually going on. So, なんか、まず白、ね、でね、夜ベース。夜は何十度。ロジョンジに白。ね、そういう店なんだが、茶は彼氏はいいのが、それ白ってどう。なんかそれ白、夜は9時ら、ニュモンタンジェでべき白って
then the mind becomes vaster. And then not only vaster, but also you will understand the potential of the mind much better. And then you should analyze uh, those who are close to you, like your family and your friends, uh, so to say that we should prevent attachment from taking over, because that happens very easily. And then the compassion we have, although we might have compassion for our friends and, and family members, but that is often is mixed with attachment. So it should be a kind of compassion free of an affliction. In a similar way, our intelligence should be free of, of afflictions. Uh, when it's mixed with afflictions, then uh, we don't accomplish our aims, so to say, or we will lose actually our good intentions. Because if you have a an, an, an kind of form of compassion and that is mixed with attachment, then when the situation or the relationship is changing, then aversion can take over and we might lose our compassion right, for that particular individual. So it's very important to have a wisdom that uh, is there, but also not just a wisdom, also wisdom or we could say intelligence that is free of any form uh, of infliction. So then if you understand these aspects, then we see actually what are the causes for suffering and what is actually the nature of suffering. And then uh, we also see the need to produce a kind of pure form or unstained form of intelligence uh, together with a, with a genuine form of compassion uh, that is not mixed with, with an affliction like a, a attachment in this, in this case. Zamuli So in a similar way, we have to look at how things relate with each other, right? How cause and effects relate with each other and, and how suffering arises and how happiness arises. So that depends on the mind. Yeah? Those aspects are very much related with the mind. When we look then at the current, uh, the present world, then we see 
the majority of the people are not that much looking into these things of the mind. They're morally thinking about uh, happiness that is being gained to sensor or percept to the sen object of the senses and mainly referring to the physical body. And of course, in the, in, in the present kind of scientific world, we have incredible external conditions of, of the different things that helps us to have a comfortable life. And, and, and science has produced through physics and other aspects of science has produced an incredible amount of, of, of conditions that helps us to have an, an easy life, so to say. But that is not enough. Uh, we also need to develop the internal world. The external world development by itself will not really uh, produce ultimate happiness. Although in the external world we have uh, incredible conditions, we can take our phone and talk with a person on the other side of the planet, for example. Yeah, there are incredible conditions we have coming from science, of course. We can use that, but that by itself will not establish a kind of a sustainable form of happiness or stable form of happiness. And in order to do that aspect, we need the education of the mind. We need to understand mind science. And in order to generate uh, constructive states of mind that produce happiness like kindness, compassion, practicing patience, efforts, and wisdom, and especially intention, for example, so we can see that next to the development of the external world, we need a development of the internal world, the inner world of our mind. And if we don't have this education of the mind, uh, so to say, then although we might develop a lot of things externally, we will not really obtain a form of peace in the world. Uh, because most of the problems, as we just already talked about, of, of um, the different problems in the world, they're rooted in, in mental states, they're rooted in afflictions. So we need a combination in the near future. We need a combination of two. We need, of course, the external development for our uh, physical world or, or have an, a good life, but also we need education of the mind in order to develop our inner world. Yeah, so both of those are important. <laughs> And she and the similar the Lano, <laughs> と、<笑><笑> Nasutangi Sejil so then we have to understand um, these aspects of the need for the indication uh, of the education of the mind because the external development by itself 
uh, of our external world is not enough. And you can analyze that for yourself. You can see if the external development brings real ultimate happiness or not. We have to examine that aspect, if that's the case or not. And then we can analyze it and come to the conclusion that actually we need also an inner development, the inner development of the, the mind next to the external development of, of what we see in science or physics. We also need the internal development uh, from the science of the mind. And if we look into that a little bit deeper, then also we see that actually we're not in control. We're controlled by our afflictions and controlled by karma. So that we are not control in control, that's a good uh, insight because then we understand we need to abandon, we need to eliminate these afflictions. Because we all like uh, good things in life, we like nice clothing, nice food, nice livelihood, yeah, and also we like to achieve happiness. Although the majority of the people in this world are mainly referring to the happiness of the body rather than uh, the more uh, uh, profounder aspects of, of happiness coming from the mind. So we need also that development, the internal development. And then we can look at various aspects of our lives, that, that everything we can see as a foundation or as a house. We have our family, we have the world, uh, even uh, states of our mind, like afflictions, we can also see uh, as being a kind of a house in that way. And all these various aspects of the external world and internal world, because they have certain boundaries and, and they are kind of foundations, and not only they have boundaries and have foundations, but also they're in the nature of change. And that's also important to see that we can change our mind, we can eliminate suffering. Because we see that the afflictions like attachment and aversion creates uh, a lot of uh, uh, suffering. And in order to, when we eliminate those afflictions, then we also eliminate suffering. So we can see there's a possibility of change and everything is the nature of change and the nature of impermanence. <laughs> Our mind is a bit strange sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Shepherd Nyumun Jane Anakiwani Dindi, 
<笑>你那个是啥了 你没有一直打算买几个东西一直都是得了空气钱的连这穷都啊那些人看着我呢你空气看着都加的感觉也你要来一直都加这些东西你也要来一直哦真的你这样你这样你这样你这样你这样你这样你这样你这样你这样你这
about his mental consciousness. Chadu, Chadu 
So yeah, it's very clear that we uh, need to understand the different levels of the mind and uh, we need to use the mind because we always see, we always say that we, we kind of or we like to be a, a kind-hearted person and we never say that we like to be a bad person, right? So that's, that's kind of a part of our nature that we aspire to be a kind person and, and sometimes even we say I'm a kind person rather than I'm a bad person. So it is kind of a, a natural kind of um, attitudes we all have. Um, then we, as we said before, we need the wisdom uh, is very important in our mind trainings and the wisdom should also be focused on, on, on space-like aspects that we see the vastness of all sentient beings and, and seeing their need for happiness and not wanting suffering. That's a very important aspect of our, of our internal training because the external world or the science or the education of science we have at the moment, we are able to produce incredible uh, good conditions for livelihood, incredible conditions of machinery and, and, and hospitals, etc., that gives us a very good way of life. But even that, uh, even those aspects within science, those aspects that creates the right conditions for our lives, it also comes from the mind, right? The scientists also, they use their mind to understand how to make a particular uh, object um, and how to, you know, obviously computers and things like that. It's all created by beings, human beings with, with consciousness. So it means that that also comes from an education of the mind. But that external or the education of these external developments is not enough. We need in order to prevent uh, problems from coming into our lives in order to have a happier life with more satisfaction. We need to protect the mind. We need to guard the mind or subdue the mind, so to say. And that we can only do by understanding the different negative thoughts or the conceptualities related with those negative thoughts, but then also see that even afflictions and negative thoughts, they momentary, they also change moment by moment. So there's a possibility of change. And the mind, as we know, the mind that apprehends various objects, the mind itself is, is not a shape or a color. Yeah? The mind itself, consciousness itself, is something completely different. Uh, from the physical world. Then in, in the current science, in particular the science of neuroscience, for example, then we cannot really understand consciousness or mind itself. And why is that so? Because the, the equipment we have at the moment that we use in empirical science is a kind of very coarse aspects we can measure. We can only measure very coarse aspects. And the mind is, is much more subtler. So that indicates that, uh, yeah, with a, current science, we cannot really completely comprehend what consciousness is all about. But we can, without doubt, we can understand ourselves that we all want happiness and do not want suffering. That is kind of an innate wish we all share, and that's not too difficult to examine and not too difficult to come to the conclusion. But then if we like to abandon suffering and accomplish happiness, then also we should know and look at the stages of, of temporary happiness and ultimate happiness and look at the vastness of the mind and understand the actual reality of, of, of the mind and, and its objects, as well as try to develop uh, things, uh, qualities of the mind like love and kindness. Yeah, we have the technique of seeing all sentient beings as your mother, remember the kindness, etc. And then, although not easy to generate these kind of mind trainings, but possible. And because it's possible, and the more you use wisdom uh, in this way, then by the power of habituation, you can change the mind. And that is also true for challenging topics like, like rebirth or, or, or compassion. Also there, we can use wisdom that understands the interdependence and the continuity of consciousness. And then we can uh, understand how to develop 
these qualities of the mind, like love and kindness and wisdom. And by doing so, by using an habituation towards that, then we eventually are capable of eliminating all the negative thoughts or eliminating incorrect forms of, of perception. Yeah? So we eventually able to eliminate afflictions and the root of afflictions, ignorance. So, we must have a mature layer, share up true layer de layer, semi genes in the Tara Mombuzido, his own Namazo, Namjun, the Hatunji sim, the share up the pneumonium, the shook chimbo children do, and G, Suzuki, Chimzan, Lamson, took you to Matuja Bashoriari, Matim Bizzi. Anji, Susula, Kamiju, Vatachi, Susu Susula, Yichi, Didi, Kadisha Gurzena, the D, Rangisim, Rangin de Mare, the D, Tura de Ribero, Ranginda, Tura Nin, Yeva Chiavaina, and Rang, Rangin, she chola dry, tap chiadua, Nimba de Ayrua, and the same in a Karina, Chigra, Jija Chejavaina, and the Susu, Shedandia, Maran Paui, Maran Rangi, Chena Jimara. This is a dungeon, and she ain't doing. So what dungy you may just some of bang with you? The summer all dungy rangers is lady, Sanji Jum Dindi, Tamone, Chungo, soon you did another. So semi rangin de moon to soon and do. The soon the Nazo Kang, you're the baggy, dungy de water and do. That is not to sell up. A dungy water, my young mother, dungy water, not dungy can't do it, but cheaper your mother, see what say. Cassi in Jerawa. One is enough. Don't anything as a mortal cohesor. Don't he read that don't eat tongue, jury tongue, chiba to see tongue, and see because of the tongue ranging in Bazi. So the half one? Don't eat the half one, don't eat the sova tongue, the Mandeva. Then it to the number Tamji do. And it bet Missy Tongue he read the Shinaza would eat. Then it had it not Gasa Marina, Kagami, think I go Mogo Sigura. Devoted the two zombie, Kaisna, not a cotton, see you do. The true dinner, Munzin Chicoser. Gumba Tazan's inna, me chuluda, and in me Tazanda, then Jenchina, Jimbachina. That it's in Barra. Mone, Chashi, maybe Tony, and Gunna Pindic Druna. Some on a Pindic Druina, and Druvala, Chajin de des Chapata, Jimba, Rangula, Chajinula, Dangandi. Die and then, as a casual rosy, Rangi, Takwaina, Temper Druva, Rangi, Temper Druva, Nahi, Takwazi Yoaina, then a gutrup sea shigmaro. And as a Michi Takwa Mizioaina, D, and 
So yeah, we need to um, understand um, the different types of, of, of wisdom yeah, and uh, that related with the coarser and subtle states of mind. And then we will move in a particular direction because most of the time we have afflictions in our mind and with those afflictions we make a distinction between us and them and, and we have a short-sighted state of mind that we only think about our family and then there's problems in the family and then we lo lose our patience, for example. So there's a constant habituation of, of creating the causes for suffering. Yeah, we have a strong habituation to, to, to harmful intents or covetousness or, or ignorance or jealousy, for example, and that are the cause for suffering. So we should try to abandon those causes of suffering or abandon those types of afflictions. And that is possible because we can see that those afflictions are not an innate part of our mind. They're not a part of the true nature of our mind. They are mistaken forms of consciousness, as we say. And, and that are already two reasons why we can eliminate using our, our mental consciousness, using wisdom, that we can eliminate these types of afflictions. And we need uh, to, to do that if we want to eliminate suffering, because we have to eliminate the cause for suffering. And then not only for yourself, but then also uh, for others. Yeah? So we try to strive to eliminate the cause for, uh, of suffering for self and others, to eliminate those causes for suffering. And that we can also see that these causes of suffering are not innate parts of the mind, right? These afflictions are not a part of the mind's nature, 
so to say. So that proves that we can separate ourselves from these advantageous uh, afflictions. And we all need happiness and don't want suffering. That's very clear. Yeah. But most people in the world, although they want uh, happiness and don't want suffering, they don't really know how to create the causes for happiness and how to eliminate the causes uh, for suffering. Yeah, because many beings in the world today just uh, constantly create these causes for, for, um, for suffering themselves. So we need to change that. Yeah, then we have to understand different types of suffering. Yeah, we have the suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, and the all pervasive compounded form of suffering. And it's also important to understand those three types of suffering. And, and, and with on that understanding, be capable of eliminating uh, those uh, types of suffering. Because often we are uh, overpowered by or controlled by afflictions like, like attachment and, and aversion. And uh, we don't want them. So, but the problem is that most people don't want them, don't want suffering, but they don't know the methods. Yeah, people lacking the methods to eliminate these kind of causes for suffering, to eliminate these afflictions. So the wish itself of wanting happiness and not wanting suffering, the wish itself is not enough. We need to use wisdom in, in analyzing these aspects of the mind and then eliminating these afflictions. And as we talked about before, we have different boundaries of different houses. We have our own boundary of our own family or our own kind of country. Or, or in, in the monastic systems, we also have monasteries and nunneries in the different traditions. And there's a danger of saying that uh, this is our view or this is our monastery. Or this. So you make a distinction between us and them. And then you cannot really benefit yourself, you cannot really benefit others. So it's very important to eliminate these afflictions because by the power of attachment, we make a strong, have a strong inclination to, protection, to protect our friends, so to say, and everything that is harmful towards our boundary or our home or our family, then we generate aversion towards those who harm. So um, that is not really very constructive. So we have to eliminate those afflictions. Uh, so why and how do we do that? Uh, by understanding emptiness. Emptiness is a very important uh, aspect of the teachings, the ultimate nature of reality. And uh, if you believe in emptiness or not, if you believe in ultimate reality or not, that is not really of much of a difference because that ultimate reality remains the same if you believe in it or not. And uh, we can look at that all things appear to, to be established truly, yeah, things appear uh, in a permanent way. But if you really analyze, you can actually see that things lacking this self of true existence, things are in the nature of change. And there's, by the power of understanding dependent origination, we will understand emptiness, and by the power of dependent origination, we also see that things are in the nature of dependence. For example, we see things are in the nature of cause and effect dependence, right? And we have dependence on parts and a collection of parts, and we see the different types of dependence among the different elements, so to say. So that dependence that we see is only possible if things do not exist in and by themselves. Yeah? Dependence is only possible if things lack true existence. And this lacking true existence is exactly what we call emptiness. So if you contemplate these aspects and then you look at the root of these afflictions, and you can eliminate this root of, these roots of afflictions with the understanding of emptiness, then you will generate a kind of faith of belief in, in, in the possibility of the achievement of liberation. Yeah? So by understanding these aspects with wisdom, we see that we can accomplish uh, liberation uh, ourselves. And it's important to understand emptiness well, because there's a lot of misunderstandings regarding emptiness. If, for, for example, say, the space between you and me, that is emptiness. Yeah? Then you, there's a danger of, of completely misunderstanding it, and there's even a danger of falling into the view of nihilism. Yeah? So it's very important to get a correct understanding. And that correct understanding of emptiness comes by the power of dependent origination. Yeah? The law of, of interdependence is very important to be understood well. If you understand this law of dependent origination well, then also you will understand karma. You will also understand how uh, negative types of karma produce suffering and how positive states of karma produces happiness. Yeah? So that's kind of a dependence in our continuity of consciousness we call karma. So that dependence is to be understood 
if that dependence is understood well, then also we see that there is a dependence of impermanence. Things are in the nature of momentary change. And what happens with these afflictions, like uh, attachment and aversion, they basically grasp at things in an inherent way or a true way, that we grasp at objects or people to exist in and by themselves. And if you analyze this aspect, nothing exists in and by itself. Yeah? So if you understand this aspect of emptiness correctly, then you will eliminate uh, the establishment of true existence or grasping at a self, and then you will be able to eliminate um, attachment and aversion. So it's very important to use the wisdom understanding these things, and then if you look at these aspects, then you will generate a real genuine form of renunciation if you really understand the three types of suffering, and you understand how the suffering is caused by these afflictions, and you understand how you can eliminate these afflictions by eliminating ignorance then your generation of renunciation, of wishing to be free of the suffering of samsara, becomes very genuine and very profound. So we need a separation of the mind, so we need a separation of suffering, and we can see that suffering and the causes of suffering are not an innate part of the mind. They're not a part of the mind's ultimate nature, so to say. And that is also a reason why we can see that it is possible to eliminate these temporary or adventitious afflictions and eventually achieve the state of liberation. So yeah, we need this wisdom analyzing these, analyzing these aspects, as we just talked about, and then we will eventually be able to achieve liberation. And then before liberation is, is achieved, then using these aspects of wisdom, we were capable of generating positive states of mind as well, yeah, on our parts, uh, like love and kindness, compassion, and then eventually bodhicitta. Mm. Kinzangazo Mazu Dunjinchamigimizumala, so, the do Jigdu, Jujinatu, and Jigdu, Jinatu, 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 and Jigdu, J
Kasi Nangshikchina So yeah, um, we need these aspects of wisdom that is we, uh, we talked about uh, already quite in depth. And then um, when we understand uh, the reality better, then uh, we will able to eliminate these afflictions like attachment and aversion. And um, that is true for our end. And we, it's not that we exchange attachment and aversion or something like that. It's the, it's, it's the transformation of the mind. That's what's happening. And why can we transform the mind? Why can we eliminate attachment and aversion? Because they are rooted in a concept of I and mine. Yeah, we, we grasp to an I, we grasp to a mine, we grasp to I this, I that. And in a similar way, we grasp to my house, my work, my family. So we uh, grasp at a particular reality in a very solid and inherent uh, true way. And, and our aggregates, yeah, our body and our mind, for example, if you analyze, you see they do not exist in that concrete way. Yeah, our body and mind are in the nature of momentary change, for example. And uh, then when, when understanding this, this uh, aspect of change or momentary aspect of reality, then we can see that states of mind also are in that same nature. Yeah? Like uh, we have that the aspects of constructive forms of, of mind, like love and kindness, being in the nature of 
of the cause and effect relationships or impermanence as well as aversion and attachment. If you look a little bit closer to how to understand this reality better, then we could just look at the inner world and the outer world, for example, and, and look at, for example, the body, the different bones, the flesh, the different parts of the body, and the different vessels and organs in the body. And then you see there is a dependence there. It does not exist in and by itself. In a similar way, if you look at external objects, yeah, if it's your house, for example, then the house might appear in a very solid, independent way. But if you analyze, it's made out of bricks, cement, and there's windows and floors. So it's made out of many parts, and those parts depending on each other. So by understanding these aspects, for example, of your body and, and external objects, then you get a sense of, of what actually is the reality. And you get a sense that things do not exist that solid out there as we think they do. And the afflictions like attachment and aversion, they exactly rooted in seeing things very solid. They rooted in seeing objects, inner and outer objects, in a very solid way. So then, if you look for your body, for example, or outer objects, and you look how the way they appear in a very independent way, existing by themselves, or existing truly or inherently, then if you really look, you cannot really find that aspect in your body, you cannot really find that aspect in external objects. So um, things look very stable, but they are not that stable as they appear. And that is also true for many aspects of reality. If you look in, 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 the, in the quantum world of subatomic particles, if you look in colors and shapes, we see the same kind of nature that things are not existing from their own side, that things existing in the nature of dependence. And that's an impermanent reality, and by understanding that our body also momentary integrates and momentary changes. And by seeing those aspects, then using wisdom, then we also see that uh, these afflictions like attachment and aversion, they just are misunderstanding reality. They just grasp at a reality that's not really there. And so that's kind of how we can use wisdom to eliminate or initially reduce afflictions like attachment and aversion, and then eventually eliminate them. So we should see the body and our family, for example, and, and if we use these techniques well, and we see the real reality of our body and our family and, and things around us, then we can develop and we can reduce these kind of afflictions. If we don't use this kind of wisdom and we just have a nice life and have a good job and, and, and take care of our family, take care of our children, then we're not much different from animals, because animals can do the same thing. Animals, they can also take care of their children. But we have to go a step further and use our human intelligence to develop. And that human intelligence uh, to be developed, we use in order to see that things do not exist inherently. And by seeing so, uh, or understanding that ultimate nature of reality, we will reduce these afflictions like attachment and aversion. And of course, we need a body. It's not that you have to give up your body if you see the different parts of your body. That's not the, the meaning behind here, uh, behind these points. But to see that if you look for this inner end body, you cannot find. You only come to the conclusion that the body is merely imputed by the mind. And that's the same is true for the objects around us. And although they appear in a very concrete inner end way, but actually that's an illusion. That is actually the illusion aspect. And if you look uh, from that perspective, then things become very precious. Then your body and, and the, the things around you become very precious if you have that kind of understanding. And if you also then understand the ultimate nature of the mind that can completely comprehend reality as it is, that is also very precious, isn't it? If you really can generate a mind like that. So we have to understand the mind and we have to understand how things appear to us. For example, at home, you might have a shrine or an altar and although it appears in a very solid way, but actually it's all in the same nature of the clear light mind. So we have to understand these aspects with wisdom, and then things in life become very precious. If you don't really engage in this kind of analytical approaches of wisdom, then your life will just be wasted, like just reciting Omani Pe Mi without anything knowing about the meaning of it. <laughs> So that's very needed to, to generate bodhicitta, but not just bodhicitta, but try to join bodhicitta with, with wisdom. 